but also in other sort of smaller cities around the uh, country. Um, but that uh, reflects the other uh, point, which is that the um, those that made up uh, that urban revolution were in many ways disconnected um, from the populations within rural Egypt. Um, and, but that um, would eventually change, I think, um, uh, two years later, uh, the June 30th uh, demonstrations that called for the removal of Gorsi had very large participation um, from the rural classes. Um, and as I said before, we came known as 
the birthplace of the revolution. And um, we see another uh, protest uh, in 2008, in Mahan, or another strike in Mahan in 2008, where it was even bigger um, and even more effective, in, not just in um, putting forth uh, their socioeconomic demands on the industry, but very effective in um, getting the attention and support of people around the country. One of the organizations that is always referred to as being a leader in the youth movement in the Egyptian revolution is the April 6th Youth Movement. The April 6th Youth Movement was created um, after a group of youth used social media to organize a general strike in Cairo in support of the textile workers who um, were calling for a strike in Mahala. And they were targeted and persecuted as a result um, of that call for a general strike. And that strike was called for April 6, 2008. And that's how they became known, 2006, and that's how they became known as the April 6 movement. No, 2008, I'm sorry. Um, and in the three years leading up to 2011, from 2008 to 2011, there was a worker agitation, strike, a work stoppage, every single day for the entire three-day period leading up to the revolution. So, um, so the labor movement, even more than the anti-imperialist, anti-police brutality movement, had been for a very, for a very long time opening up these political spaces. But then you get to these 18 days, and um, in the beginning of those 18 days, the workers were out in the street, not as an organized class, but within their families and in their communities, in their neighborhoods. Um, and in the middle of those 18 days, when the government sort of attempted to um, sway the protesters from proceeding and to disband, um, there were protesters who uh, eventually sort of returned back to school or returned back to work. And many of those workers, after like three or four days in the square at the beginning, resumed work the following Monday. And when they went back to work, they began to then talk amongst themselves about what was happening in Zambia and what was happening in the country. And it was then that many of these workers made the decision to now continue to protest Mubarak and call for his fall through um, as an organized class and through um, a number of strikes that began to take place within those 18 days throughout the country. It led to many multinational corporations threatening to leave Egypt as a result of those work stoppages, as a result of those strikes. So it's, it's, it is something that is uh, very little known, um, I don't think anywhere, um, the uh, importance or significance of the workers' movement to, um, to the ability of Egyptian people to succeed in deposing Mubarak, or even to come to that point in, in, in the first place. Um, the Tahrir was part of a very long um, past uh, in, in all of these movements. Um, and, and that's not very well um, understood, I, I think, in a lot of places. And I think, you know, from this information, it shows that the workers' movement was very much at the center of that. Um, so, <clears throat> it brings us down to, um, to then, um, after Mubarak is deposed, and I think, and continued resistance um, against the ruling elite um, and against the oppressive state. Except that the dynamics of the popular movement of the revolution changed during that time. A lot of the middle class forces 
that were in Tahrir during um, the original 18 days to oppose Mubarak returned home and even sort of returned to uh, this attitude of, okay, Mubarak is gone, let's see what we can do, let's see what Scott can do for us, and even opposed the continuation of strikes, etc. Um, and those, uh, and after those middle class entity, uh, elements uh, began to sort of leave those public spaces, we see sort of the emergence of um, a block of uh, working class youth who began to come to the demonstrations in larger numbers, putting themselves at the uh, front, at the front lines of the resistance against the military at that time. And in addition to those working class youth, um, we see also at that time a very strong presence of football fans. I don't know if you heard this about Egypt, but there are fan, football fans referred to as ultras who have clubs where they go to football matches and uh, root for their team. And you know, and many of them, some are uh, like lower middle class, working class, some are. Um, it, it, it's sort of a mix, I think, in terms of like class background. Um, the repression of the state, police brutality um, and at the hands of people policing football matches, number one, and, you know, have faced also economic oppression in, in their inability to access football matches. And so they actually became politicized a few years before 2011 based on those experiences in the football matches. But then, as they become, became more involved, as the middle class folks left and they became more involved in um, what was happening on the streets, they began to take the slogans of the revolution to the football matches. And, uh, and they, they began to come, you know, uh, different football clubs that were very often on opposite sides, very often fighting, began to come united to these demonstrations in very, very wonderful fashion. I, I, I need to show you some of those videos, which is incredible uh, presence of, of, these, of these young men being um, And as their participation in the revolution increased, they became the target of um, the government of, that was now ruled by the military. And during that one year when the military was ruling, um, there were many massacres against um, protesters um, in near Tahrir and um, also uh, there was one uh, massacre of 45 Egyptian Christians who were protesting outside the state media office. Um, and then there was also a very horrific massacre of these football fans that took place at the football stadium in Port Said. Whereas the government or the state security uh, forces paid basically uh, thugs uh, to come to the football matches armed and at the end of the match to attack the fans uh, of the one club uh, that was very much an integral part of the revolution. And I think about 75 uh, of these young football fans died as a result of that attack. Um, a lot of it was as a result of suffocating on their stampede. But it was, it was clear evidence that it was orchestrated attack by the private by the government. So at that time, the Scott's rule was quite brutal. And uh, the revolutionary forces remained, as I said, much more sort of made up of, of, of these young working class forces um, and, um, and the left forces that uh, supported them. and was sort of more focused on the economic and social demands of workers. But um, we, we would see that um, there, there really has been a strong, a very strong strike wave that began um, in 2006, we began to see it in Mahala, but it really began in 2008 when I told you 
was three years leading up to the uprising. There was a there was a burger agitation every single day. Well, that strike wave never stopped. It actually is still going strong to this day. And in the past year, there have been almost 10,000 burger agitations in Egypt in the past year alone. And that's under Morsi's rule. Um, and it was just as active during the Scats rule. And I'll move on from Scats brutal rule uh, into the elections. And Morsi becomes president. Many people vote for him because he was um, running against the Arab world was going and it was political Islam. You know, in the Arab world, many people also said, why are we only going in this direction of political Islam? Isn't there anything else? Um, and, and we've seen that all over the Arab world for, for, for many, for the past three or four decades, going in this particular direction. And we really didn't know, um, you know, Country. Um, letting a 
uh, in Egypt, um, a pro Syria conference in which um, a lot of language was put forth there inciting um, anti Shia, anti Shia sectarianism. And uh, it was only a couple of weeks before the Jubilee demonstrations that there was a horrific, horrific mob killing of four Shia Egyptians in the city of Giza. Uh, which many people sort of believed uh, to be as a result of, of, of the sectarianism ignited um, by these reactionary uh, members of, of, uh, of, um, of the Brotherhood and also those of the Salafists who may sort of allow um, uh, to function in, in this way. Um, and so with all of that happening under the one year of, of the Brotherhood's rule, Many people sort of see, saw uh, the Brotherhood as being a counter-revolutionary force that hijacked the revolution. Um, and they also, you know, they had a feeling about them early on. And, um, and as I said, you know, the attitudes about the Brotherhood changed very dramatically. And in the first parliament elections after Mubarak was deposed, the Brotherhood received about 12 million votes. And that was in March 2011. By December of that same year, they again had parliamentary elections. The Brotherhood only received 5 million votes. So it was a very drastic change in a very short period of time. Um, again, pointing to how the revolutionary process helps to expose these sorts of reactionary elements. Um, so there, there began um, what was the beginning of kind of grassroots uh, resistance against the rule of Morsi. And um, started from some youth who were part of uh, this revolutionary process in 2011, and, and they came to be known as Tamara, which I think means mutiny, but is referred to as rebel, rebellion. Um, and um, they sort of began to uh, get participation from a wider number of individuals, including many elements of the left. And then Tamara led or joined a larger coalition opposing President Morrissey. And they began to sort of collect signatures from citizens asking um, or demanding his removal. And um, according to Mara, they were able to collect 22 million signatures. Um, I think that Morrissey was voted into office with 12 million. And many of those votes were people who voted for him only because he did not want to see his big win. But what started to happen was, um, you know, like in many places where you see a kind of uprising or revolution, for many um, years following um, the counter revolutionary institutions and the institutions of the old regime remain intact. And they certainly remain intact in, in Egypt. And um, a word that we use to refer to the remnants of the Mabadi regime or those who supported the Mabadi regime is called, uh, it's a word, um, fluid. Um, and so, you know, the fluid began to um, involve themselves in, in this coalition against Morsi. And I think that really one of the reasons that they did that is because not were they part of a reactionary secularism that opposed anything, you know, they're Muslims themselves, but there's the Islamophobia itself that exists in the Muslim world and the Arab world, and that Islamophobia is directed to anybody who chooses to identify strongly, you know, as a Muslim, either politically or socially. And so there is strong Islamophobia among a secular uh, population in Egypt. Um, whether that be left or liberal or ruling elite. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons why they became involved in this anti-Morrison campaign. But a lot of people also think it that um, the ruling class continued to really suffer, um, particularly because of the increasing worker agitations um, and other protests going on. And, and you know, and the bad economy and you know, all other sorts of things. But, uh, you know, they really had a hard time 
controlling the workers. Every leadership since Robotic has tried to criminalize strikes, has tried to stop strikes from happening. And there's always been a pushback to really legalize the ability for workers to strike. So in the, in the background, so you don't see, when people are reporting on Egypt, you don't see the struggle happening in the background between the workers and the business owners and, and um, and the struggles happening in the neighborhoods. We're just sort of seeing everything as it manifests on top. And so I think that much of the school elements thought that if they could really succeed in this coalition to overthrow the bottom, to overthrow mercy, that that could lead them into a uh, path to rid Egypt of the revolution for good. Um, and so the school began to get involved and is you began to sort of get uh, these liberal elements who were suggesting, you know, that they more actively ask the military to sort of help facilitate this process, etc. And when they began to involve themselves in, in, in those kinds of conversations, that's when the more revolutionary forces resigned from the coalition and separated themselves from that, including the English Institute movement, another youth party made up of a few thousand youth Many of them who have left the Brotherhood, I think it's called the Current Party, and the Revolutionary Socialist Party, which is probably one of the more active um, left organizations, the Trotskyist organization, one of the more active left organizations in Egypt. They're very much involved and focused on uh, building the Workers' Party and supporting the independent workers' movement. Thank you. 
action against the remaining true revolutionary forces and, and those forces that have the potential of becoming a revolutionary force. Um, but the one lesson that we've learned is that the movement must be ready um, with sort of a true uh, revolutionary party um, or a true political alternative um, that can fit into sort of the plan, like what, what's going to happen next from this step on. Um, I think in some ways things manifested themselves a little bit differently in Tunis because they had a wider, stronger, broader left with these revolutionary forces that are still there about, well, okay, we acknowledge that there is no sufficient revolutionary force on the ground now, um, but the revolution, the, the schemes that are revolutionary process are still there, so what do we need to do to move forward? And their answer will be um, to support um, the continued uh, existence of this very strongly militant um, workers. Uh, but even with that, we're starting to sort of see a situation as, as, as wonderful and um, significant and militant as the workers movement has been from 2006, 2008 to this past year. We're now beginning to see a situation where um, the counter revolutionary forces are also also the workers' movement. Um, we have the Egyptian Trade Union Federation, which is the establishment union, it's the government union that exists in the Mubarak, and um, sides with the needs and values of the business class. Um, there, there is the newly emerged Democratic uh, Workers' Congress, and there is an independent union, the Egyptian Federation and the Trade Unions. That the, the leader of that union is Kanan uh, Abu Ekka, and it had been regarded as being um, sort of the progressive left uh, independent union federation uh, that had the potential of supporting the independent workers movement that was taking place. Kanan Abu Ekka just accepted uh, an appointment with this new interim government as labor minister, and when he did so, he called for a suspension of strikes to give the new government a chance. Um, there are more radical, more progressive elements in his organization that opposed him, um, but so we're beginning to see that these challenges are now creeping into the labor movement in itself. I think in Egypt, as well as, as I, I see in other places in the Arab world, like in Jordan, that the increasing militant worker struggles are happening independent of establishment unions and also independent of these new independent federation formations. They're happening very much in, in um, you know, within workplaces, within cities, within towns. Um, and I think, you know, the important step forward is to um, think about then how within Egypt and outside of Egypt on a global level that we can support the sustainability of this unionization movement, especially the independent unionization movement. Um, and I think I wanted to share with you uh, I have to share. perhaps we can get to you somehow, but um, there's a woman by the name of Fatima Ramadan, and she's the president of the board of um, the, independent, the Egyptian Federation of Independent Trade Unions, the, the same one where I told you the, the leader um, took a position uh, with, as a labor minister and called for suspension of strikes. She opposed him. Um, she herself is coming from a long socialist tradition in, in, in um, and a working class tradition in Egypt. Um, and last Friday, the uh, FCC, um, the military general, for the people of Egypt to return to the streets. Um, uh, and essentially he was calling for them to come and support their, you know, um, the new rule, military, inter inter 
Department rule, and, in, you know, and essentially to support their vicious violent campaign against the Brotherhood. It's not that the Brotherhood hasn't been violent themselves, they have in many cases, but what the military has been doing against them is, is nothing short of, of a massacre. Um, and all three federations that I mentioned um, chose to sign on and join that march uh, that happened last Friday. Fatima Ramadan was one of the few union leaders who refused, and she wrote a very excellent statement addressed to Egyptian workers um, as to why they should not participate in the call for the military to march last Friday. And the left coalitions also abstained from that march as well. But um, perhaps some, there's some way I can share that statement with you. Um, you can look at the training of Dan It's actually a very excellent statement and will circulate it. Okay. Thank you very much.